Uh, why don't we put our hands together? We have a guest speaker here this morning. Well, not really a guest. He's here every week, but uh, Pastor Jackie's going to come and share the word of God with us. Good morning, church. I too just want to say how awesome it is that um, just to have you with us this morning. I want to especially say, young parents, I so appreciate the sacrifice that you made this morning to get here. I know exactly what a Sunday morning looks like with little people. My memory, you know, has an element of trauma on it, to be honest. It, trying to get everyone dressed and out the door and put your spiritual head on. And so God bless you especially this morning. I really do appreciate it. Hey, um, I hope you've come in this morning with your spiritual eyes open you know, it's an hour and a half on a Sunday, but I really hope that you recognise and understand and step into that it's but a moment in our Christian journey. It's but a moment in our week that we are full of the Holy Spirit when we're in and out and about there doing our day-to-day, -day. amen? So my prayer this morning is that I could just challenge you a little bit um, in the out there. Can everyone say out there? Because that's where we're called to, Amen. Um, I've been, I, I don't know ev what you're like, but I think everybody has their favourite sort of bits and bobs throughout the Word of God that you, you go back to. And um, I think I've shared with some of you in the past that I've learned something about myself over the years, that I'm not really big on the process. You know, I've, I've started projects of um, sanding and, you know, blah, blah. And I've quickly realised that I just hate the process. I just want to get the result, tick the box and move on. And poor Kirchi has had so many projects that he has had to finish for me, for me to tick the box. And so I've learnt that about myself, that I'm not really big on to the process. I just want to tick the box and move on. And so for me... The book of Mark is like awesome because he just cuts it, gets to the point and moves on, you know. For others, it's, I know Al lives and breathes the book of Acts. I just want Mark to get to the bottom line, tell me what the deal is and move on. So I've been back in the book of Mark recently and I just want to share this passage, Mark 1, verse 23 to 25. It says, Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And verse 25 says, But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. For those of you who are big into titles, I think the title of my message this morning is Hindrances to Having a Posture of Obedience. Let me just pray. Father, I want to thank you for an awesome day. Lord, I want to thank you that every person in this place today, Father, has chosen to come in and to worship you and to fix their eyes on you, Father. So I pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would come, that you would meet with us, Lord, that you would take these words of mine, Father, that you would somehow make sense of them and speak something to each member here in a language that they would understand. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage of scripture is a reminder that even the demons knew who Jesus was when they were in his presence. Even the demons knew who Jesus was. The demons recognised the authority of Jesus and they obeyed him immediately. Jesus told them to come out of him and immediately, everyone say immediately, and immediately they obeyed and came out of him. My question to us this morning is, do we recognise, do we as the body of Christ recognise the authority of Jesus when he speaks to us? Because he does speak to us. We don't worship a statue this morning or we don't um, worship an ideology. We worship a living God who speaks to us, who yearns for relationship for us, who somehow in his, you know, crazy mind has a plan that we're going to be part of his outworking of his presence on the earth today. That's the God that we serve. So he does speak to us. It's just a matter of do we recognise his authority when he does. As I mentioned, I've been reading the Gospel of Mark and I'm amazed at how often there was a response of obedience required. Jesus says, drop your nets, come follow me, and immediately they obeyed. James and John are on the beach. They've just been out and had a go at fishing on the trawler. 
gross, but now they're back and they're fixing their nets and getting ready to go out again. Jesus called them and immediately they dropped everything and followed him, left family. Can you imagine? Jesus called and immediately they responded. I'm convinced of one thing, that if we truly want to be effective for Christ, if we truly want to pick up our cross and follow him, if we truly want to be part of this great movement of believers, then it's going to require of us obedience, radical obedience, choosing a posture of obedience. And the truth is, if you've given your heart to Jesus today, the reality is you'll go home and spend eternity with him and you don't have to be that person. But when I read the book of Acts and I read what the New Testament looks like, I want to get in amongst it. I want to be that person that can lay hands on the sick and see them healed. I want to go to the funeral, to the dead body and see them raised up. And we laugh about it, but you know what? They're not just stories. They happen. They're real accounts of what went down back in the day. So often we hesitate to obey the prompting of God because we worry about whether or not we know enough or whether we're theologically trained. Am I the only one? I am the only one. You Spiros. <laughs> Acts 4 verse 13 to 14 says this. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. You know what that says to me? Something was on Peter and John. Something was on when Peter and John walked into the synagogue and walked into the grocer and walked into their day to day. Something was on them that people perceived, that people recognized that there was a difference about them. How many of you here can say, honestly, you walk into Aldi and someone just says there's something different about you? How many of you walk into your office and someone says there's just something different about you? Don't you want to be that believer? Don't you want to be that person that people recognize there's something different about you and they marvel at you? They realised that they'd been with Jesus. They, there was something different about them where they could differentiate between people who hadn't been with Jesus and yet these two had been with Jesus. Yet here we have two uneducated hillbillies, untrained, hadn't been to Bible college, hadn't heard of seminary. In the Greek, you know what? It literally means illiterate idiots. Am I the only one? Amen? This is us he's talking to. But Peter and John had a posture of obedience. They recognised that when Jesus spoke to them and they obeyed. Verse 20 says, For we cannot but speak the things which he has seen and heard. There was something so powerful about them knowing who Jesus was that they couldn't help but speak the things that they'd seen and the things that they'd heard. Are we the same? Can we not but help go and share the gospel of Jesus because we can't contain what we've seen and heard? I want to offer three thoughts this morning. Only, and you may have a various other reasons why you hold back. But I just want to pose three common reasons that I think we, or what hinders us from having a posture of obedience. And the first one is the fear of man. John 12, 42, 43 says, Nevertheless... Even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. So there were multitudes of people who believed in Jesus. But because of these religious leaders who were known to be the know-all of all of all of all passages of Scripture, they knew everything about God. Because of that, they feared what they would think more. And so they didn't even say that they knew him. They did not acknowledge at all that they believed that Jesus was who he said he was. They did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. I think that can be like us today. We don't want to look different. We don't want to sound different. We live in a culture that if you speak up about Jesus at the moment, it's not cool. And you are actually ostracized. We don't want to be outcasted from the friend group. We don't want to have the office people not speak to us anymore. We don't want to not get picked for the sport team because we have chosen to step into obedience and be all that God's created us to be. So we remain quiet when the topic comes up, what are you doing on the weekend? And you'll list everything you're doing by going to church on Sunday. Am I the only one? We don't want to say that we're believers of Jesus. We don't want to be seen to be too radical or too over the top. When that friend or colleague walks in or comes to visit and they're sick, and we know that we can lay hands on them and pray, and God said that he'll heal the sick, 
but what if they make fun of us or what if they think we're crazy so we say nothing? We think about praying for them but we hesitate. We think we'll just do it quietly to ourselves. What about when current culture is hostile towards Christianity? I mean, you've only got to hop on social media to see. And this is the church people, I might say. That's before you get out there. And there's digs at the church and there's digs at the body. But we don't want to say anything because what if? But they did not confess him lest they be put out of the synagogue. The fear of of man, sorry, is in direct opposition to being a believer who has a posture of obedience. If you fear more of what people will think than what God does, then you are struggling today with the fear of man. The second reason I want to pose is that obedience can sometimes be inconvenient. I had a... um, I had a situation recently, a few years back, I, as I've mentioned to many of you who have been around for a while, I used to work at the Ramada down in Ballina. And I met some of the most beautiful people down in that place, it, be it guests that are coming, be it colleagues, just beautiful people. And one day, this vivacious, bubbly, burly woman walked up to the counter and she had, you know, like big Coke bottle glasses, bright green. I thought, whoa, go you. And she was um, eccentric and bubbly and you could tell she just had this big personality and her name was Bronnie. And um, she came and stayed at the hotel and throughout her visit um, that particular time we got to know one another and chatting and I got to hear a little bit of a story. And as it turned out, Bronnie and her husband Chris um, would come back every year. Um, and they would holiday in Ballina and they'd stay at the Ramada. And we would, tr- you know, cross emails and text messages and phone calls. And we c- began to um, build this beautiful little friendship. Uh, Bronnie had no children and so there was only her and her husband. Anyway, um, as time went on, I got a phone call from Bronnie. And you have to understand, she was like bubbly. or You know, one of those people just all the time and had a beautiful big personality. But this day when she phoned me, she wasn't like that. She was quiet. She just said, Jackie. And she went quiet. And I thought, oh, wow, this is something's wrong. This is not like Bronnie. And she said, I've been diagnosed with bowel cancer. I was like, okay. Now, the time before this, right, she came and we had dinner together. And um, in the midst of the conversation, it suddenly occurred to me, she'd never asked me what what we do or what we're about. And so this particular time, she says, and we'd talk footy, like she was a crazy Tiger supporter, her husband was a crazy Canal supporter, I'm Roosters, he's Tigers. Like we'd had all this bantering back and forth. And just out of the blue at dinner, she says to me, hey, what does your husband do? And I thought, well, here's a go, because that can often be a clanker, right? You you sort of say your husband's a pastor, and then it can either be cool, or it can be like, weird lady, avoid. So when I said that, oh, you know, it's funny you should mention that, he's a pastor. And you know what? There was this moment of silence, where I could see she was trying to fit it all together, and, you know, does he does he match that? I mean, he's got a tattoo and I'm used to a collar. Like you could just see the cogs burning over. But you know what? She never said a word. She just let it go. And so here we are. We're on the phone call and she's been diagnosed with bowel cancer. And I said to her, you know what? That's okay. What's the prognosis? Like, are we treating? What are we doing? I just thought, let's go matter of factly because she's clearly very heightened. And she said, no, they're going to treat it. There's chemotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know what? I never said anything. Hung up the phone. Albie and I started to pray for her. Anyway, I guess within probably six to eight months, she calls me back and she was so excited. She said, you know what? I've gone in, I've had the PET scan and they think they've got it all. And, you know, it went from devastation phone call to back to Bronnie being vivacious and bubbly and happy and life's good and the future's great and we've booked our next holiday and we're going to do this, that and the other. And look, I reckon it would have been about three months after that. And this time, Chris, her husband, calls me. And he's distressed. And he said, Jackie, it's back. The cancer's back. Only this time, they said it's too aggressive. It's spread too far and she's terminal. And he, he was just a mess. And I figured Bronnie was too because she couldn't come and talk to me. And so, you know, for the next little while, we exchanged text messages and we had phone calls. And often they'd be in silence because, you know, what can you say? And then I got a text from Chris to say that she's palliative. Now, for some of you who are part of Arise Regular, you'll remember Alan and I went away earlier in the year to Mudgee 
um, down south um, to have a holiday with some friends from Victoria. And while we were down there, because I, you know, I'm from the Golden State, Queensland, so this land is foreign to me, and so I don't know the geography of a lot of New South Wales. And so while we were down in this beautiful place, Mudgee, um, I said to Al, I don't exactly know where we are in relation to where Bronnie is, but I'm kind of thinking it might be nice to call in and see her on our way home. And we probably had that conversation half a dozen times and... Will I? Won't I? Should I? I oh, probably should. You know, should I? Where is it even? And how far away? And anyway, I ended up saying to Al, you know what? Don't worry about it. I just can't get my head around. It's already an eight-hour trip home. And the reality is I can go and see her one weekend um, from home. So we'll just go straight home. Well, I guess we'd been home about a month. And Chris texted me and he said, Jackie, she's gone. She's passed away. And... You know, the thing that he kept saying to me was, I just can't get past how scared she was about dying. And, you know, I'm on this end going, missed opportunity. It was inconvenient. God, you were prompting me. I recognise now you were prompting me. But it was just inconvenient. It was going to add another two hours onto my trip. So I chose to come home because I'll catch up with her. But, you know, we're not guaranteed of the tomorrows, are we? And look, there's no condemnation, amen, for those in Christ Jesus. And I repented to God. But I want to say to you, I missed an opportunity. And I recognise that the prompting of the Holy Spirit was to go and see that woman and share the gospel of Jesus. And to my knowledge, the last time I spoke to her, she did not acknowledge Jesus as her Lord and Saviour. What happened in those last moments, I don't know. What I do know is God gave me an opportunity. And I missed it because it was inconvenient. Obedience is often inconvenient. The third reason I want to suggest that we struggle to have a posture of obedience is that we have no expectation that God will speak to us or that God will lead us. In our workplace, in our families, at the grocer, we kind of go through our week doing our, doing our week, doing our life, and then we come to church on a Sunday, maybe, maybe not. And we just kind of tap into God then. But we don't go out there with an expectation that God is going to speak to me today. God has something for me to do today. I've shared with you, as I did just before when I worked at the Ramada, and I'm sure many of you struggle with this similar thing, but I, I got to a point where I'd been there maybe three or four years, and I was saying to Al, what am I doing with my life? Am I making a difference? You know, I got saved, went into YWAM and we were in missions. And I want to say, young people, young people, if you are under 20, listen to me. Ministry is great. Missions is great. We don't hear these things anymore. Churches do not speak about, you, you know, we all send them off to university or we send them off to do trades. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But I'm saying ministry is great. Serving God is awesome. And we need to pray for those kids. You know, we've got kids at the school I work with and they're in a battle. I'm telling you, they're in a battle. But there are some kids like Jordan. Where's Jordan? You know what? Standing tall, standing solid, believing in Jesus. God, I love that. I love that. Anyway, diversion. When I was at Ramadan, we went on a holiday, another holiday. Amazing how when you get out of your norm and God speaks to you. And we're on a holiday and I'm saying to God, what am I doing? Am I making a difference? And I felt like God said this to me. He said, the gift of God, Jackie, is not just limited to where you are in church. The gift of God that's on your life, it makes way for itself. And so when you go into your workplace, the gift of God makes way for you. When you go into the grocer, the gift of God makes way for you. For whatever, So whatever the gift of God is on your life, it makes way for itself because it's beyond you. It's God, God wanting to work in and through you to reach others. And so when we came back from holidays, I went back to work at the Ramada and I'd had a whole mentality shift. I decided that I was going to go in each morning and look for opportunities. Look for opportunities to love on people, to speak encouragement into people, to speak truth into people, to pray for people, to share the gospel with people. And you know what? I tell you, here am I in this secular place with, you know, my GM was a Buddhist, like it's all going on. I had the most fabulous opportunities I've ever had, way more than ever in a Christian setting. It was the most wonderful space when, when you have a mentality shift and you actually listen and look for opportunities that God is giving you. It is amazing how many are there. 
we even had the opportunity, you know, um, my GM at the time was a Buddhist and she invited us in. She said, I don't know what it is, but when you come on shift, it can be all going on, but you're just calm. <laughs> I never thought somebody would call me calm, but anyway, you know what? She could see something. It's like Peter and John. There was something upon them and they marveled. And so this lady, she said, I want you and your husband to come in and I want you to pray through the building. Hello? Hello? That is God making a room. That, that is God ha creating an opportunity. Now, I'm sure each of us can think of times in retrospect, like me with Bronnie, where you've missed an opportunity, where you look back and think, God, that was you. That was you. Don't get stuck there. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're sitting here today thinking God won't use me because I'm scared to speak up, he has given me opportunities and I blew it. He's given me opportunities but I'm uneducated. I don't know enough about the Bible. I know Alan said when he did that series on, you know, gender and et cetera, et cetera, the common feedback was I, I know it's wrong but I just didn't know what to say. You know what? Back yourself. He's promised already that it doesn't matter. In those moments you just step up and he'll give you the words to say at the right time. I guess the question is, why would he keep coming to us, though, if he knows we're going to keep saying no? I think that's the only time he will move on to somebody else, is when he knows that he'll constantly get a no. Some time ago, I spoke at a meeting, a bit similar to this. And after the meeting, someone approached me. And they so lovingly told me everything they felt that I said wrong, did wrong, should have said, could have said, would have said. And I guess bared their heart about how... Um, I had not re reached their, um, what's the word, their, their thoughts of what I should, expectation did some, great, thank you. Anyway, I never thought much of it at the time. I politely said thank you for the feedback and we moved on. How many of you know we have a shadow having a conversation though? <laughs> anyway, some months after I noticed something about myself. I would get opportunity to do things up the front, I'd get opportunity to say things to people or um, to preach a message or to do a communion. And you know what? I always had a reason why. I said, no, I'm busy that week. Oh, thanks, but no, give it to someone else. I had people waiting for me to book dates in of things that I was supposed to lead. Yet I noticed, I just knew I was procrastinating. But I just couldn't get, I just struggled to get there to go, come on, come on, just do it. Anyway, I was getting ready for church one morning. I was in the shower and the Holy Spirit took me back to that moment where that person approached me and said, you know what? You've allowed fear to speak louder to you than faith. You've allowed fear to speak louder to you than faith and you've backed away from what I've called you to do. Listen, I've learned one thing in being in ministry, one thing, one big thing. There's always going to be negs. There's just always going to be people who will say someone can do it better than you. There's always going to be people in your office who people will say there's someone better than you. There's going to be someone who can sing better than you, play better than you, whatever, run better than you. There'll always be that. But the difference is whether God is calling you. <clears throat> what I do know is God is calling us to a life of obedience, of immediate obedience. Don't be like Lot's wife. Don't look back to all the reasons why you shouldn't run into all that God has for you. We can be our own worst critics. And you know what? The funny thing is God already knows all of our limitation. God knows our insecurities. God knows our inferiorities, yet he still calls us. He still provides us with opportunity. Whatever God is calling you to be obedient to, it will always be good, simply because he is always good. It may be inconvenient. You know what? It may add an hour onto your trip. It may cause you to go the long way home. It may cause you to forego that in order to do this. It may be inconvenient. It may also require you to go against current culture and it may even cost you some relationships, truth be told. But it will always, always be good. Let me just close with this story. In Matthew 2... Verse 13 to 14, it says this. Now when they, the wise men, had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, 
flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So now when he, Joseph, arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. How many of you know travelling with an infant? It's inconvenient. How many of you know travelling with an, with an infant on a camel in the night is ridiculous? It was inconvenient. Mary may have even been annoyed to have to pack up the tent, throw it on the back of the camel and head out through the night. It would have not only been inconvenient, but I'm suggesting that Joseph may also well have had to choose fearing God more than fearing man, or in this case, woman. And speak of what he felt God directed him to do, but he was so sure that God had, God had spoken to him to arise and go elsewhere. Yet, regardless of all of that, Joseph chose obedience. He knew it was God leading him. Then what do you do? What do you do when you know that God has spoken to you? What do you do when God has called you to do something? And it's a choice. The truth is we're part of a ch uh, the, the church, the big picture, the body, because Jesus made a choice. You know what? God had a plan, but he had to choose to walk in it and, and do what he did. That's the reality. Or we, you and I aren't here today. What do you do when God offers an opportunity? In the end, Joseph's obedience saved Jesus' life as an infant. It was a choice. Now, I know some of you here have had God speak to you. I know he has because we've had conversations about it. And you know it was God. You can even take me to the passage. You can take me to the place. You can remember the emotion and the feeling when he spoke it to you. What are you doing with what God has spoken to you? For some of you to obey God, it will cost you your reputation. People will think this about you. In order to obey God, they're going to think that about you. Or maybe it'll just be different. It will always be good because he is good. Remember that. God is always good. Are you being like Lot's wife and looking back at all the missed opportunity and thinking, what is the point? The truth is, I could continue to look back at the missed opportunity with Bronnie. I could kick myself for the rest of my days at the missed opportunity with Bronnie. Or I could just decide, you know what, next time it comes along, oh, I'm going to be all over that. I'm going to choose the inconvenient trip. Are you fearing more man than what you're fearing God? Is it all just too inconvenient, too hard, too big, too challenging? What's that thing you know God has spoken to you? What's that God desire that you carry in your heart? What's the God dream that you have abandoned because someone did or said something that left you feeling discouraged? You know, we talk so much about the days that we're in and we read scripture and we see what God wants to do on the earth. And you know, the distance between that and this is, is going to require radical obedience. It just really is. What we've done for all these years, it's not going to be enough because we're living in pretty raucous days. And if scripture is true, which we believe it to be, then it's going to get a little bit more raucous. So it's going to require us to have a posture of obedience when he does speak to us. Obey. Choose obedience every time because he's a good God. My prayer for each person here is that you will let go of the past, press on to a life of obedience, to knowing God, that he only has good things for his children, that you were born for more, that you literally, our, our, our um, phrase around INC is that you were born for more. And you know what? It's not just a cheesy phrase. I truly believe it. We are born for more than just going through the motions and the functions of the day to day. I honestly believe that God wants to use us to radically, radically impact our community. So whatever the gift of God is that's on your life, and you, you will know what it is. He will have spoken to you. Let me say this. It makes way for itself. The pressure is off you. The pressure, you don't need to strive. You don't need to go off to seminary school, although if you feel called to do that, go for it. But you just need to step up to the plate. I just need to step up to the plate. Look for the opportunities. Leave here and look for the opportunities. If you're going to the grocer after church, expect that he will speak to you. When you walk into your office this morning, this week, expect that he will speak to you. He will lead you. There'll be someone he'll be pointing out to you. And have a go. 
what have you got to lose? Amen. God is a good God, but he, but he is calling us to put on our big people pants and start walking in the things that he's called us to do. Amen. Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you this morning, Lord, that you don't just leave us, God, that we don't just have that moment with you and then you walk away and leave us, God, but that, Father, you've called us to a greater purpose than just our salvation, Lord. You, the creator of the universe, wants to co-work with us on the earth to see lives change, to see hearts radically imp impacted by the gospel of Jesus. God, I thank you, Lord, that you can use ordinary, uneducated, untalented, untrained people like us. And yet, Lord, you can turn the world upside down. Father, use us. Use us, God. Use us as a faith community. Lord, we want to be that person that has a posture of obedience, that when you look to and fro, you can see us, God, that you know that we'll say yes, you know that we'll step up, you know that we'll step out in faith, God, and, and say yes to you. Father, I pray that in this room this morning and, and for those online, God, that you would stir up the gift of God. You'll stir up, Father, the gifts and talents that are within each person, Lord, and that you would give us courage to move in them, Father, to not just put them to the side, God, to not just see that we go to work Monday to Friday and then we put on our spiritual pants, but, God, to look for opportunities in the day-to-day, -to, -day, to look for opportunities, God, to see the, the doors that you're opening for us, Father, and to trust you and step into all that you've created us to be. Father, I pray blessing over every person in this room this morning and those online. God, help us to be a people that have a posture of obedience. In Jesus' name, amen.